Welcome back to our series on Frameboard Profitability, a step-by-step -step guide to better frameboard management. In our first session, we learned that more is not always better, and that we defined a roadmap that helped us determine the total number of collections that should be showcased in our optical dispensary. And our series continues today with session two, selecting your brands. Our areas of focus are going to be defining frame categories. We're gonna talk about different pricing strategies. We're gonna take a deep dive into price points, getting organized, your return on investment, and some tips for success. When it comes to frame board management and frame buying, there is no cookie cutter approach. And the things that we're gonna talk about are just general guidelines and is really dependent upon the size of your practice, the number of frames that we're gonna showcase in the dispensary and our patient demographics. One thing that we have to keep in mind is that frame board management is not a one and done initiative. It's a living, breathing strategy and we have to monitor, track and refine as needed. And we accomplish this by a couple of different ways. One, by periodically assessing our turn rates, as well as a profitability analysis. We're going to start today by separating your frames into categories and then converting those counts into a percentage of your total board space. And we're going to start with frame categorization, beginning with luxury brands. These are very high end. They're not affordable to the average consumer. And when I think about these brands, I think about things like Lindbergh, Goldenwood, and Cartier. One thing that I want to point out about luxury brands is that there are typically some contractual requirements. And one of those includes the number of units to bring in one of these brands. So make sure you have those conversations with the reps and ensure that the brand is good for your practice. Next is tier one. These are very high fashion, they're recognizable brands. They're things like Gucci, Dior, Fendi, and Chanel. Tier two, these are moderate fashion. They include some sports brands, definitely value, but not nearly as expensive as tier one. And when I think about these brands, I think about things like Oakley and Nike, um, uh, Banana Republic, Ray-Ban, all make up tier two. Tier three, these are no names that hold no significant value in the fashion world. There are things like CoverGirl, Pepsi, and Skechers. Core, core is just core. Um, and every major manufacturer has one. Marchand, Safalo, Clear Vision, pick one. You don't need all three. Niche, they're fun, they're funky, and they're very colorful. And when I think about those frames, I think about Woo and ProDesign and Silhouette. And then lastly, we have our high margin. These are frames that can be purchased at 60 to 65% less than that frame's data cost. There are some non-branded high margin product, but there's also branded product that you can purchase significantly less and all of our major manufacturers provide high margin product. The next thing we're gonna do is convert our allocation into percentages. So we're gonna use the practice that we did in session one. And remember that when we mapped out their optical, we determined that they could physically showcase 435 units within their dispensary. So what I wanna do is take these categories, we're gonna determine the percentages, and from there, it'll tell us the number of units for each one of these categories. We're gonna start off with luxury. So with this particular practice, we were very heavy in tier three and core product and our frame averages were very low. So to start off with, we streamlined the entire planogram and we really focused more heavily on bringing in tier one and tier two product. You can see that both of these categories um, make up the crux of our planogram. Um, coming back to luxury, you know, it is a brand that we will, a category that we will definitely bring in, um, but at this particular time, we wanted to hold off and focus on um, rebuilding that planogram. Um, we didn't have a niche brand, and it was definitely one that the patient demographics could support. So we started off with just one um, that equates to 6.4% of our total board space coming in at 28 units out of that 435. Um, as I mentioned earlier, 
um, core. They had three different core brands. You don't need three. Pick one, go a little bit deeper in that. Um, so allocated 10% of that board space um, and that came out for 43 units of a core product. And then high margin product, I definitely wanted some, um, wanted my board space to be about 20%. Um, and of the 435 units, that equates to about 87 units. So that's how we define this. And just understanding that um, if we ever decide to bring in a luxury brand, we might have to shift you know, one of these other tiers. So maybe we um, move some of the tier one into the luxury and the tier two up to the tier one. Um, and we really focus in on that tier one luxury department, but you know, that's down the road. Good start. The next thing we're gonna do is determine our price point percentages. So here you can see that, you know, our, the minimum retail price point that we have in house is between 150 to 199. We decided to go all the way up to 599 as our high point. So we have a high price point and we have a low price point. And then in between, you know, we've got the two to 249, the 250 to 299, so forth and so on. So here we wanted to determine what is those percentage of these retail price points. Um, you can see again that 200 to 249 is about 33% um, of, our, of our total retail price points. Um, as we get higher in those price points, the allocation percentages go down as do the number of units. Um, so again, you know, we have to monitor and we have to track what's selling, what's not selling. And um, maybe um, what we may have to do is, you know, if we're, we're not selling enough of the four to 499, maybe we don't have enough product in that area. Um, or maybe we don't have the right brand. And that's what I'm talking about when we say we have to monitor and track and refine as needed. Um, the next thing that we have to do is um, demographics by gender. Uh, and so typically I like to um, allocate about 50% of my board space to women, 30% to men, and unisex comes in at about 20%. Next, we're going to establish a pricing system in our practice. And we're going to begin by identifying our minimum list price. Minimum list price is the lowest a frame will be offered to consumers regardless of what we as providers pay for it. The most common value is $169. Honestly, you wanna set that minimum list price to what your practice demographics can support. I've seen it as low as 159 and as high as 189 but the most common is 169. The next and the tr most traditional method is um, selecting your multiplier. Most practices are using three times or 3.2. Anything over 3.2 and you run the risk of um, outpricing your frames. So be careful on your multiplier. But basically you're going to multiply your cost, your frame cost, by that multiplier that you've chosen. So let's take a look at an example. We have a $40 frame um, at frame data cost. Our multiplier is three, um, and that equates to $120. We have a $60 frame data cost. Again, we multiply that by three, and that equates to $180. So if our minimum list price is $169, the frame in example A would be priced at $169. Remember, it is the lowest frame that we're going to offer consumers regardless of what we pay for it. Make sense? To make the shopping experience pleasant and easy, you want to group by a specific category. Um, some of those options and categories can be by gender, it could be by a specific brand, it could be by price point. It's whatever makes sense for your practice. Keeping in mind that attention to detail sends the message that we truly care about helping our patients select the frame um, that's going to meet their needs. So when you look at organizing your frames, one of the most dramatic uh, dispensaries that I've seen 
is that, you know, you can be one of two spectrums. You can just have a sea of frames in the dispensary. There's no branding um, whatsoever. You just, you have no idea what this practice um, um, provides its consumers. Or you can do like what's on the other two sides here, where you take a board and you divide it in half and the top part of the board is one brand, the bottom half of the board is another brand. If you take a look at the picture, you can see that you know there is a placard there, um, it clearly defines who the brand is, and there is a case with a frame that showcases that. The image on the far right um, is Pro Design. You can see that um, there's a nice deep collection what you can't see above it is a beautiful placard that um, highlights ProDesign. So making sure that you have branding um, is essential. It helps your patients understand um, what brands you carry. It keeps it organized and it looks so nice when it's done. Um, your return on investment is key and it should be of the primary goal. So you want to talk to people whose opinions matter the most. Who are those people? They're your patients. Um, it's important that we meet their needs as well as their wants. So how do we do this? It's really easy. Call your patients and ask them. You have to call every single one of them, but take a small sampling of those that purchase and those that don't. And so what are we focusing on? Questions relating to their experience. How do they feel about their collections? Was there something that they wanted to see that we didn't have? Um, did they easily find what they were looking for? And when you hone in on those two groups of people, you're getting input on both sides. This gives you a very well-balanced perspective on what those opportunities might be within your frame board planogram. Lastly, we're gonna talk about some tips for success. So first and foremost, the common mistake that I always see is that um, when, it, when it relates to frame buying is that we purchase similar brands. We purchase a brand that has a higher price point than another brand. Well, I can tell you what our patients are going to steer to. We've got two brands that look alike. I'm gonna spend money on the frame that costs the least, right? So the higher price point is going to sit and it's not going to turn. Um, so what you want to do is decide on the price point and stick to it. As I mentioned earlier, core products are core products, and they look very similar amongst all manufacturers, right? So how many of those do you need? You only need one. Focus on, um, you know, one manufacturer, you're going to have higher turn rates, and quite honestly, you're going to have a better relationship with your rep. Unless you're expanding your frame inventory, don't bring in new product without getting rid of the old. So you need to make a plan, right? Um, what does that plan entail in helping us move out the old inventory? So you can do a couple of things. You can mark the product down. You can create very aggressive frame and lens packages that include the old product that we're trying to move out. Um, or you can set up a clearance area. Um, quite honestly, another great way that you could bring in new product um, is talk with reps. Can you exchange old product to bring in new? Um, they call them buyback programs and they are so great. They very little um, monetary value that you have to put out. And really you exchange the old for the new um, you've got fresh new product and um, makes your patients excited as well as your team. Your frame reps know what's hot in your area. So in spend, instead of spending countless hours perusing through bags upon bags upon bags, ask them to show you what are their top eight to 10 styles. Go with those. I can assure you they're best sellers versus something that is, might be pretty cool, or I think it's pretty cool, but again, that comes down to emotional buying. Our customers, consumers, our patients, they want value, but they also want options. So don't be afraid to diversify. 
So what's coming up next? In session three, we're going to be positioning for managed care. Thanks so much for listening today, and we'll see you back in our session three.